Snell's laws of reflection and refraction are wrong. Well, maybe that's a little bit of a clickbait title, and I apologize for that. But I can certainly say that Snell's law are not exact for practical waves. Let's get into it. Let's look at a simple case where we have the interface between two different materials that have two different refractive indices. So we have medium one with refractive index N1 and medium two with refractive index N2. This is the classic setup for analyzing Snell's law of reflection and refraction. Let's let there be an incident beam. And that beam is incident at an angle theta one. This is often called the angle of incidence. Well, when a beam is incident onto an interface, two other things happen. One, we can have a reflected wave. So we have a reflected beam. And it is at some angle, theta r. Well, here's our first Snell's law. The Snell's law of reflection says that the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence. And this is pretty intuitive about any of us have played billiards and you hit a ball against the cushion on the side, it bounces off at the same angle that it hits. So this makes a lot of sense. The second thing that can happen at that interface is that we have a transmitted beam. And that transmitted beam will be at some angle theta two, which we can see is a little bit different than theta one. And it turns out this bends because the waves are traveling at different speeds on either side of the interface. So in order to match the boundary conditions, the wave has to bend. And so Snell's law of refraction is the equation that relates the angles and refractive indices. Maybe not said often enough are the limitations of Snell's laws. It turns out Snell's laws are only correct for plane waves and when medium one and medium two have no loss or gain. So first, we need to answer what is a plane wave? Well, one thing about a plane wave is it is of infinite extent. So our plane waves extend from one side of the known universe all the way to the other and beyond that even. So they're infinitely large. That is not very practical. Another aspect of plane waves is that they exist over all time. So if we're looking at a plane wave that existed before the Big Bang and lasts all the way after the big stretch or the big crunch or whatever happens to the end of the universe. Again, this is not very practical. It turns out that all physical waves are actually finite beams and they're finite in time too. That's not quite as important to this argument as finite in space. And maybe you have a wave that emits from an antenna that's of finite extent. Maybe it's a laser beam and it's collimated. That is of finite of ex extent. Maybe we're interested in a waveguide mode, a guided mode that is of finite extent. There really are no examples of physical waves of infinite size. Everything is finite. And so let's think about this. How do we get a finite beam? Well, mathematically, if we Fourier transform this, and don't worry about what that is if you don't know what a Fourier transform is, but in fact, we can show that finite beams are actually made of a set or a continuum of plane waves. So if we took a whole bunch of plane waves, all the different angles, and we gave them just the right amplitude, said each one's going to have a unique amplitude and phase, and if we added those up, we would get our beam. So all physical waves are really composed of wave components traveling at different angles. So we have a beam here that looks like it's going left to right, but in fact, there's components of this propagating upward and downward. There's another thing that we need to consider, something called the Fresnel equations. When a wave encounters an interface between two mediums, yes, it reflects and yes, it transmits and Snell's law of refraction predicts the angles, but how much reflects and how much transmits? Well, it turns out those come from the 
Fresnel equations. And just looking at these equations, we don't really need to understand a whole lot about them other than they contain our angles. They contain the angle of incidence and the angle of transmission. Therefore, the amount of that wave that transmits or reflects depends on the angle. Now back to our original case where we have a beam that's incident, we have one that reflects and one that transmits. Well, it's a beam. We know a lot of things now. A beam is actually composed of a continuum of plane waves. So there's parts of that beam, that input beam, that are traveling to the right and traveling to the left and, and not in the direction that to our eyes it looks like that beam is going. We also know something else, that waves at different angles will have a different amplitude upon reflection or transmission due to the Fresnel equations. So when that beam reflects, that beam can't look like the incident beam. And in fact, due to the Fresnel equations, the reflected and transmitted beams are a bit asymmetric. Well, asymmetric beams don't propagate in the directions that we think. And in fact, they propagate away at slightly different angles. So Snell's law are not exact for all physical waves. Snell's law are only exact for plane waves and lossless materials. I didn't even really get into the whole lossless and how that can affect things, but that produces inhomogeneous asymmetric waves as well. Thank you so much for listening to this. If you like this type of visual learning, check out all the other learning resources we have in computation and electromagnetics at empossible.net. It really helps me if you click the like button and it helps me even more if you subscribe.